Um, you've all visited the observatory tower, haven't you? Um, William West bought the, an abandoned snuff mill and installed a camera obscure there in 1829. Um, a five inch convex lens with a sloping mirror in the roof projects light onto a white concave metal dish five feet in diameter. Now, um, of course, nowadays with cinema and plasma screens, uh, we take moving images for granted, but we, and we just regard the, 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 um, the, the image projected of the bridge or whatever onto the saucer shaped disc as, as a bit quaint. Um, but back then it must have astonished visitors. Uh, work began on the suspension bridge on the Clifton side in 1831, um, two years after William West had set up his Obscura. So Clifton folk would have spied on the groundworks below them as the navvies prepared the plateau for the abutment and tower. William West is a really interesting chap, both a painter and inventor. His painting of the Israelites led by a pillar of fire is in the city art gallery and will blow you away. Well worth seeing. Um, he kitted out the observatory, installing a collection of telescopes and optical instruments, including a Newtonian telescope of 20 feet focal length and 12 inch aperture. He took a keen interest in photography, which was then, of course, in its infancy. He experimented in what was termed photogenic drawing, which is basically light sensitive paper. And by 1839, he was selling it in shilling packets, each identified with his initial W. Now with his knowledge of lenses and light sensitive paper, he also took photographs, very early ones which don't survive. Remember, this was the era of Fox Tolbert. So if we consider that date of 1839, work on the Clifton Tower had been abandoned, but the massive Lee Woods vaults were nearing completion and the view would have made a compelling subject to record. West knew Brunel, and when work on the bridge had foundered in 1831, he looked at ways to reduce cost. He even went to Fribourg in Switzerland to view a cable bridge, but Brunel convinced the bridge committee to stick with chains. Um, but sadly, we have no images of that early construction work on the bridge, and none of Brunel as a young man. In fact, we only have eight photographs of Brunel, mostly featuring him on the SS Great Eastern and all taken close to the end of his life in the eight, late 1850s. Also in 1839, a few miles away in Ham Green House at Pill, it's now the Penny Brown Cancer Care Clinic, a young lady, Sarah Ann Bright, was experimenting with West's photographic paper. She was one of nine children and her father, Richard, was a wealthy merchant and banker, and one of the founder members of the Bristol Institution for the Advancement of Science, Literature, and the Arts. Sarah's brother, also Richard, was a distinguished physician. He was Brunel's doctor, and he gave his name to Bright's disease, nephritis, from which Brunel suffered, actually. Um, Sarah drew and painted watercolors, so she was quite artistic. In my research, I discovered that the Bright family's current generation lives in Melbourne. The generations of them have been there since the 1850s. They are really Australian aristocracy. They live in Turak, one of the country's most exclusive suburbs. Um, I recently contacted the Brights and Primmy, Primrose Bright, was interested to hear from me and sent me a very long, warm, informative email in return. I shall read a portion of it, which offers a fascinating glimpse into the sophisticated lifestyle of a wealthy family nearly 200 years ago. So this is this email to me. Sarah's early education would have been the norm for young ladies being tutored at home in reading, writing, and at least one language with sewing, dancing, singing, and painting included. However, her real education would have taken a different form because she was Richard Bright's daughter. The atmosphere that surrounded their lives at Ham Green was alive with possibilities. The scientist in Richard imbued all his children with powers of observation, that, but the girls at home, most particularly so, the boys were sent away to the school. 
because of the rich variety of visitors that he drew into their family life. Botanists, geologists, explorers, chemists, physicians, electricians, all knew him. He was acquainted with Joseph Priestley, Josiah Wedgwood, and Benjamin Franklin. Part amateur inventor, he knew and corresponded with the men of the Lunar Society in Birmingham. Always makes me smile the Lunar Society's name because I understand the, the clever chaps in Birmingham used to meet up and talk late into the night and then they'd go home. But it was so dark there without street lights in those days, they only chose full moon night so they could see, see to where their front door was. So, and they called themselves lunatics. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Humphrey Davy was there. He taught the bright children how to fish using a fly. All three daughters were accomplished watercolorists and we have some of their exquisite works. However, it was Sarah who purchased her watercolor paper from Lancaster's shop. Now I've checked, there were two Lancaster shops. One was in um, Gloucester Row, which is that great big Georgian rank, which is on, as if you were coming across the bridge coming into Clifton, it's, it's on the right hand side overlooking Clifton Green. And the other one was in Broad Street in the, in the city centre. Well, the bridge wasn't built then, so we can assume she went to Broad Street and bought her little shilling packet of this sensitive paper. And she would have coincidentally read the advertisement for light sensitive paper made by West in the local newspaper and began experimenting with the earliest form of photography over a three month period in the summer of 1839. Sarah captured an image of a leaf it bears a W on the paper and the initials SAB, the same as on her paintings. Its provenance was questioned in, uh, at Sotheby's New York auction house as recently as 2008, but it was eventually confirmed in 2015. So let's just consider this. A few miles from the bridge site, Sarah produced what is regarded as the world's earliest surviving photographic image taken by a woman. Her brother knew Brunel. He, in turn, knew West. So let's indulge in a, a bit of whimsy, eh? Did Sarah progress from her leaf photo to a more ambitious subject? Surely she would relish the opportunity to record the building of, at, the same, at, uh, at that time, the longest suspension bridge in the world. Just imagine Brunel proudly standing astride the 34-metre-high Leewood's abutment. What a great image. It would certainly trump the one with him and the backdrop of chains, wouldn't it? So let's hope that in time, some more of Sarah's images will turn up. 